What's up, everybody? What's going on? We're here with another episode of the Life Journey Podcast. We are once again going, crossing over the borders to Canada. Uh, yesterday, we had uh, Brian from Toronto, and today we have a special guest from Ottawa, Canada, and we have Glenn Duncan. How's it going, Glenn? Doing really well, Quentin. Good to, uh, good to, good to hear from you today, and happy to be here. Thank you. Appreciate you being on the show. Man, yeah, me and Glenn met uh, up in Ottawa, Canada. Um, he worked with our Ottawa Tourism Board and they do some great work over there. And yeah, Glenn, like kind of dive in a little bit about yourself. I know you went to, well, was it Mick, uh, McCraw, with Grant McCraw University in Edmonton? Yeah, okay. yeah, well, it's, a, it's actually uh, pronounced Grant McEwen, who McEwen. was a, okay. a, a <laughs> okay. political figure out in uh, Edmonton, Florida, <laughs> Canada. But uh, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I, lo I love the intro, by the way, because I was uh, we were talking football here in the last few days, both sides of the border, and uh, talking about the uh, the likelihood that either the CFL is going to come back in a shortened season uh, later this year. What's happening with the NFL? Uh, right. Fingers crossed, absolutely. Uh, I'm a huge sports fan, as you know. Football's my my thing, and uh, uh, yeah, that's kind of what uh, introduced introduced uh, me to you, but. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll remain hopeful here in Canada that we'll see both uh, Canadian and uh, American stuff in the near future. But, um, yes, indeed, hometown, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, was born and raised there many years ago. Love it still today. It still feels like uh, like my hometown, although I'm very happy to say I have two hometowns. Um, and did some of my uh, training at a university uh, called Grant McEwen University in that city. Um, but, you know, I, it's funny, the... Uh, the hospitality and tourism part of my life um, came through various uh, courses at various institutions, but I'm one of those rare breeds that probably doesn't point to a, uh, a specific certificate or diploma. I'm, I'm still clinging on to that University of Life diploma that, uh, that's got me to where I am today, to be honest. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're, it, it seemed, I was just looking through like your bio and like you were like, I don't know, like you, you, you were prepared for just the, the hospitality, travel, tourism, like sector. Like, I don't know, like you were at, were you working with the Edmonton Tourism Board for a bit as a managing director, then t that was about 10 years, right? And then you, trans you transitioned over to Ottawa. Talk a little bit about uh, that whole experience of why you dove into hospitality and it could have been anything else. You, you chose hospitality. Yeah, you know, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll go way back in time, more years than I care to admit, but I'll tell you, uh, back in my uh, in my early days, my, my dream, my aspiration was to own a restaurant, and so uh, I started taking some courses and some training in that in that field. In fact, uh, one of my very first certificates or, or trained up uh, professions was bartending, and mm. those who know those who know me well won't be surprised by that. But uh, that that's uh, when I was. Uh, a young guy just out of school uh, definitely had my mixology degree. Won a few awards for being a mixologist, and I was focused in that in that uh, direction. Um, as most of us, you know, through various changes in life and career changes and different things that happen uh, circumstantially, um, I was out of the hospitality industry for a number of years in different sectors. And when I uh, was reintroduced back into uh, bartending, restaurant management, hotel management back in the nineteen nineties. It led me to a conversation with Edmonton Tourism and the good folks in the tourism business tree, tourism business, pardon me, uh, in Western Canada. And it was, it was, you know, when it was like the lights came on that day. It was something that, that brought me back into the field that I have nothing but passion for. Um, I remember telling my wife at the time, uh, "This is my calling. I'm back where I need to be." And uh, how perfect was it that I could sell the city in which I grew up? I could sell the city and all its assets and its its sports teams and its its tourism um, attractions and all the different things that I loved about living there. I could now travel around the world and represent that city as a, as a job to get paid for it. So it really was uh, a homecoming of sorts for me from a career perspective. And I've really never looked back and I've worked for what we call a destination marketing organization ever since over 20 years now in two cities. And I consider myself very lucky to have done so. That is awesome. That is awesome. Like it's, being able to represent an entire city like what does that feel like like explain that express, express the feeling like of that how, how does that feel to like you are like in control of that like whatever you do 
makes the city either is gonna people are gonna come or, or they're not gonna come or they, or the marketing aspect of it like they're gonna see it or they're not how does I that feel it's, is it a palm of your hand like <laughs> it's a super question and it's it's it actually can be quite daunting if i think if you overthink it i remember uh my probably my first week on the job in edmonton i remember my boss telling me book a plane to Washington DC, I'll meet you there. And there's a trade show that we got to do on Tuesday. And you're going to be the one responsible for selling Edmonton, Alberta, Canada in the Washington DC region. And I remember thinking to myself, Oh my God, I am so far in over my head here. This, this isn't, this isn't even going to be funny. Uh, <laughs> but what, what I noticed was when I got off the plane in DC, that you know, the, the adrenaline and the, and the pride and, and the fact that I, I wanted to do it so well, but overlaying the, with that was that you know I, this this is kind of an industry that you either sink or swim in and i found out really quickly that i was able to put a smile on my face i was lucky enough to be liked by the clients and liked by the industry and i uh, found out really quick that you know selling a destination or representing the city being those being that face to the city and regardless of what market you are you're in um, came natural to me and it was so exciting and, and just felt like such a privilege and I remember my boss telling me at the time, you know, if you look around the country of Canada, there's only a handful of people that have the same job, Glenn, as, as you do. And, you know, take that advice and, and, and take it seriously and have a lot of fun with it. So I've practiced that, uh, that you know, that uh, uh, philosophy over the last 20 some years. And um, still to this day, it gives me goosebumps to, uh, to stand up on a stage in Scotland or China or, or somewhere in the U.S. and, and uh Make a presentation about my city, host a host an event, uh, take people to an NFL game, and, and uh, promote my city. Whatever it might be, um, super cool job, and it's one that I I've always take it seriously. But it certainly has a big privilege. That is awesome. That is awesome. What? So, how do you how do you guys like decide which? So you, you travel to these different countries or these different cities in the U.S. How do you decide which city or countries like? has the most interest like is it just because of the trade show that may be there or like what's the determination of that yeah it's a really good question and you know there's a there's a few different sectors of uh of our industry that we'd probably pay attention to that are maybe maybe that's the easiest way to answer it so from a uh, meetings and conventions and business travel business events type of sector within tourism that's something that most cities um really recognize as being an economic driver and then there's you know just the, the leisure visitor the Groups that come in via buses or, or organized tours, or even just the, what we call fully independent traveler and FIT traveler that that just wants to explore different parts of the world. We have pretty good intelligence, pretty good data, as most cities do, on what regions and areas those are. Uh, so, mm -hmm. I mean, for Canada, we know that the U.S. is always going to be a very strong market. Uh, we have certain countries in Europe that we know are always going to perform well for this part of, of the world. So we sort of know ahead of time based on research and data where we should be active. Now there's always opportunities to grow markets, but to answer your question, we've got it narrowed down before we even really get in the game and it's based on historical numbers as well as forecasting numbers and trends and that's you know the kind of dry part of the industry, but it's very important. Um, and we've, you know, if, if I look at one of the changes that's probably been the biggest change in the industry over the last 10 years. It's the collection of data. Everybody's super good at it. Um, right. whether, whether it's our friends in Toronto and Montreal, who we compete with quite often, um, or anywhere around the world, people are pretty good at uh, collecting the data and, and interpreting it. So that's just an example of, uh, you know, how we decide and where we'll spend our money. And uh, it'll certainly, you know, now that we're talking about a, a world pandemic, it'll certainly be even more important that we're, uh, well educated on where we're going to try and go to market for the next couple of years. Yeah, talk a little. Yeah, talk a little bit about this COVID nineteen and how it's affecting the travel tourism sector, and how will countries bounce back? Because um, as, as they slowly open up, and I, I believe like Costa Rica is opening up on June fifteenth, Colombia is opening up on August thirteenth, and I don't, I don't know when Canada is opening up, but a lot of these countries are opening up slowly. What's what's the yeah? What's 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 happening? Well, how are, are people adjusting to it? Yeah, million dollar question, and it's, I'll tell you, it's it's pretty scary. And I was talking to uh, a, pa a panel uh, the other day, a global board that I sit on, and, you know, if we look back into February of this year, I would tell you that uh, Ottawa tourism in our industry had never been stronger. The, the uh, mm. pro prognosis was never stronger. We were looking forward to probably our best year that we, we never had, and all of a sudden, 
course, everything goes upside down. So um, most most destinations have similar models to ours, not exactly, but to give you an idea, we are 100% reliant on a hotel tax that comes back to our organization to be able to sales and sell and market our city. So at this particular point in time, we are basically down to zero revenue. We, uh, we're just surviving, just staying afloat. And um, you talk about different countries and different jurisdictions opening up. Um, in Canada right now, we are seeing some of the easing of restrictions and those jurisdictions opening up, opening up as well. However, at a very, very slow pace, and it's a little bit staggered across the country. So the province in which I live in, Ontario, we're going very slow. We've got a few businesses open. There's some restaurants doing takeout. There's some curbside retail. There's mm -hmm. some golf. There's some golf that's starting to happen as well. But there's really, there's not really anticipated to be any, anything in the way of tourism until very late summer, which makes uh, our position a very precarious one. So. Um, our biggest hope right now is that, it, that now that the numbers and the curves have flattened and the numbers have declined, that that is the continued trend, that even with the easing of restrictions and the slow reopening of our industry, that that continues over the next weeks and months. What we cannot afford, absolutely not afford, is a second wave. That could be catastrophic to tourism, and so we're just hopeful that, that we're all managing this correctly, we're all going to obey the rules, and we're all going to take it very seriously, very slowly as we go forward. But it's been, you know, in short, but it's been absolutely, um, completely 100% destructive. We know that it's, it's not quite going to be the same ever again, at least for a long time. And, uh, you know, I just, I talked previously about my passion for traveling around the world and representing my destination. Well, quite honestly, that's not going to happen the same way anytime soon. We, like most Canadian and most North American destinations, we're going to be all focused here at home. We're not going to. We're not going to see long-term, long-haul international travel coming back, in my opinion, in the near future. So very mm. scary. Man. So yes, yeah, it definitely changed the climate for sure. Is yeah. And if you look at you know meetings and conventions is another area to talk about. That um, you know, how does that come back? How do how do we now get conventions into into Rochester, New York, or Chicago, Illinois of five thousand people and, and still obey? physical distancing and health and cleanliness and uh, planes and, and food and beverage and convention centers and accommodation suppliers. How does that all tie in and, and come together? Still, nobody has the answers. We're all thinking about it and talking about it. We all have the desire to bring that super part of our industry back. But it's uh, it, it's it's always going to be different, I believe. Now It's always going to look different. And every city is going to have to think about how we execute that. Mm. Yeah, because you can't, you can't do a Zoom a Zoom conference with 200 people and promote your city in one room yeah. or breakout rooms. That's kind of pointless. So you yeah. better be person. Well, they're talking, I mean, the, the, the new buzzword, of course, is, is hybrid meetings. And I think that's going to become part of the new normal. Certainly there's going to be an element where people are going to expect to be able to stay home, still access the content of the convention. There'll be those who will feel safe traveling. Um, so I know that I know of organizations right now that are, that are planning events big events um, in, that, in, that, in that way is thinking about you know, how there's going to be all elements, Zoom calls, in-person, face-to-face, social events, etc. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, it definitely is. It's definitely, yeah, everything's changing. Yeah, I, I was talking to some of my friends out in Ethiopia and Colombia and they're hurt, yeah, like tourism operators, they're, they're hurting. They're hurting right now and, you know, that's where they're getting their business from, you know, and, uh, it's, it's, it's sad to see, but hopefully there's a way something happens where, you know, it can get back to normal at some point, at yeah. some point, it'll take a while, but yeah. well, I feel, I feel sorry for the operators and the, and the small business owners, you know, they, they're, they're really hurting. Like you say, some of them will never be back. Um, um, you know, there's the estimates that, you know, the same as in the U S the, the estimates and forecasts on how many businesses will be lost, how many jobs will be permanently lost is mm -hmm. absolutely mind boggling. It's so, so sad. And, and we know that when we do get back into the tourism game, um, even, even here, our landscape will be different. We'll have, we'll have less to sell, less, less to attract. And I think that's going to be the same the world over. So it's, it's a big, it's a big hole. Um, it is, it is the reality that we're dealing with. And as you say, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty sad to see everybody hurting. Right. And even with the, I know, uh, when we met on before, like the sports tourism stuff, like even that, 
right now like we there's no we don't know what's going to happen with that right They're, the events got canceled for the summertime i'm guessing and that bringing attracts a lot of people to cities you know for all every city that holds events um man like so how i don't know like yeah how how is yeah what do you do about that is it in the same conversation where you were saying it before or like is there a way to are they going to push it further in the fall like what what's the way to kind of still hold on and yeah this this part's pretty near and dear to my heart and, and you know a little bit of my history you know going back to my childhood days when i since i saw my very first cfl game to you know to all the sports that i've been able to be so passionate about be involved in um yeah it's a big part of our industry we you know we have a we have a department right within our own organization uh, sport tourism major event attraction um you look at you look across the country now with with most mass mass most mass gatherings being canceled, no permits being given out for festivals and concerts and sport events. Um, you know, when I were talking earlier about the, the CFL trying to salvage a season this year, we don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, yeah, pretty pretty scary. It looks, you know, in many ways that it's the whole year is a bit of a wipeout and, and uh, there's some question marks in 2021. So, um, and, you know, that, that's another part of the economy that's just completely upside down. Um, not a lot, not to mention, you know, the, the whole mental health aspect around sports and right. being able to either play, uh, take your kid to, to, to play, go watch live professional sports or otherwise, uh, it's, it's a big gap in, in our community. And I know there's some talk about, you know, the only league maybe in the world that could afford to play to empty stadiums may or may not be the NFL. To, you know, that's probably an arguable point, but, um, I, you know, both sides of the border, we're trying to figure that out. And it's uh, definitely part of the... Uh, doom and gloom landscape even though we're still trying to hang on to some hope for maybe a condensed nhl season this summer that there's still talk of that going on um and, but uh, time will tell mm -hmm. i feel you on that in, in a way to i guess you know companies different businesses have been adjusting and finding a way to still capture an audience how have you guys been doing that currently to keep you know attention on Ottawa and keep letting them know like, hey, like make sure when we do open, come on up. Yeah, really good question. We've been talking about that a lot lately and answering that question a lot. Uh, when this first happened in March, you know, our, our first, uh, to be quite honest, our first uh, instinct and duty was just to keep the organization afloat. So we, uh, like most destinations, kind of kind of went, uh, went dark for a while intentionally and really didn't do much of anything other than just uh, figure out how we were going to uh, survive and, and uh, be operational for hopefully the rest of this year. And then we kind of dipped our toe back in the market and, and just put out, you know, some very soft, uh, empathetic type of messaging on our social media challenges. We our channels were not money you. We weren't really um, spending money on marketing. We weren't really using up any financial resources. We were really just again using those channels to to uh, keep us top of mind in our target markets, um, explain that we you know we support people staying home, stay safe, look after your family. And since then, we've been trying to just increase that turn up the heat just a little bit. Um, kind of every week, we have a, a world-renowned tulip festival here in May, so we use that opportunity to to uh, to go viral and put the beautiful images of the tulips uh, to our our global audience. And again. To tell them, you know, this isn't the year to gather and come see them. Next year will be, but for now, we'll bring the tulips to you. Um, and, and now, you know, we're kind of uh, we're, we're using this opportunity, and what a rare opportunity in history it is, to be able to, you know, just to re-examine our business model and our whole organization, and and stop for a moment and think about how do we want to reinvent ourselves, and what kind of what organizations actually get a chance to do that in the midst of global competition. It's just, super rare it's very very sad obviously but it's we've decided to use it as an opportunity to really come out as a different organization so we're in the midst of what we call our reimagine phase and mm -hmm. that also uh, quite very much includes how we're going to get back into market do exactly what you say tell tell people all the great things that you know i want when to come back the, the the really tricky part is so is everybody else and everybody else is lining up their resources and lining up their plans and their data and their staff if they have some left and they're getting they're getting ready to push that button, and whether that's June, July, August, or other. Otherwise, it's going to be such a crowded and competitive landscape that the destinations who have thought about this uh, in the best possible way and have, uh, I think, the, the you know the, the most uh, uh, appropriate tone in the messaging and the and, the, and the, the, the best targeted audiences. Those are the ones that are going to surface to the top, but it's it's going to be. Uh, 
a real need to do things right and do it with compassion and do it again with the understanding of, of what's changed. Um, you know, you look at yourself and your family right now. Um, you know, how, how anxious are you to get on a plane and travel somewhere? And how safe do you feel staying in a hotel? I mean, these things have to come back slowly but surely. And, and yet, and yet, we realize this is our lifeline. This is what we make our living off of. So, um, I, I would argue this uh, this June, July, August period is, is absolutely the most critical in the history of not only Ottawa tours but tourism in general. Oh man, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a lot of people definitely traveling once they do open up the borders from different countries. But it's, it's yeah, like you said, it's gonna be a very interesting one to see. What do you think about? I, I've seen this with uh, tr uh, travel. Oh yeah, um, Australia. You know their their travel page on LinkedIn. Virtual tourism. I've been seeing a lot of that. Virtual tourism, um, and then also VR. Would, would that technology come into play? When I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just. Thinking ideas like would that technology coming to play, wearing goggles and walking around Ottawa. I don't know what is that something that <laughs> have we come to this point, or is just a hump in the road for now until things clear up. Yeah, no, I I think it has to. I think you know we we certainly are, are, are paying attention to it. I think there's nothing off the table. I think uh, virtual and VR, artificial intelligence, and all these different things that are happening. Uh, right, you know, we've got a, a strong component of, of uh, AI right here in our own backyard. So, um, yeah, I, I, I absolutely we're watching uh, world trends. Uh, some of the countries in uh, in that part of the world are, you know, coming out of this crisis a little sooner than we are. And, and mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, those those types of trends, that type of technology, that type of thinking, um, one hundred percent has to be part of our our new reality. Uh, you know, I, I still have uh, a really good, strong faith in the fact that. You know, travel brings people together and, and yeah. people travel, you know, for, for all sorts of reasons and that will continue. Um, but uh, until a vaccine is found, until until uh, things, you know, really have the chance to go through a year or two or more of, of you know, rebound. And, you know, we haven't really even talked about the economy that much today, let alone the, the health side of this. Um, right. Yeah, all of those things are, are certainly in, in the mix of how we would want to get a destination and a country for sure. Gotcha. So let's let's kind of uh, go left field here. Um, what's your favorite restaurant in uh, in Edmonton in Ottawa? Oh my goodness, that's such a great question. Uh, Edmonton's going to have to take me back. I haven't, I haven't lived there for over almost ten years now. So uh, but when I when I did, and I, I I'm really hopeful this restaurant's still there because that would be really bad if it's not. But there was a, a really cool restaurant in Edmonton, Alberta. Called the Hardware Grill, and the reason it got its name was it used to be a hardware store called the WW Arcade. And when I was a young boy, my father took me to this hardware store. It was the kind of hardware store where they had the kind of the, the swinging, creaking screen door, and you'd walk you'd walk across a wooden wooden floor, and you'd go up to the counter and you'd ask uh, some friendly old gentleman if he had this specific bolt or this specific screw. And he'd go to the back of the of the, uh, of the store in the warehouse, and he'd come back in about three minutes with exactly what you were looking for. He knew, he knew where it was. He knew what you wanted. And they turned this historic building in Edmonton into a, a very high class, high level uh, uh, restaurant that was phenomenal. It was where we took a lot of our clients, where we entertained a lot of our people who came in from out of town. So that would be one that comes to mind. I know Edmonton's got a great food and beverage scenes, certainly since uh, since I, I have left, it's, it's improved uh, dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, one of the one of the real hidden secrets of Ottawa is is really our culinary scene. And I had no idea until I moved here. Uh, I am so proud of what we are able to offer in all of our neighborhoods. Um, and you know, from our Bywood Market, which is historic and, and kind of more tourism related to, to uh, Wellington West and Westboro and, and at different parts of the city, even in, in our mm -hmm. suburbs of Kanata and Stittsville, there's so many great places to go that I, I can't really give you one. But I'll I'll, uh, I'll get I'll land on one that's actually in the in the basement of our in the, basement of the lobby of our office building called called Bechte because uh, uh, Stephen Bechte here is a bit of a legend in Ottawa. He owns three restaurants; they're all phenomenal. Uh, and Bechte, the one that bears his name, um, has a, an amazing um, staff, a beautiful wine bar, and a place that we uh, frequent quite often. But we're super lucky here in Ottawa. Uh, we've got, um, uh, it's definitely one of the things that I love to show off when we have people is that you can sit outside, look at the, look, have, a, have a craft beer, a 
have a gourmet hot dog, look at the parliament buildings and watch people uh, raft on by right in the middle of the, the city in whitewater rafting. So a uh, beautiful part of, of the world. And uh, uh, you're seeing my passion come out again, but uh, that's probably due to the fact that it's uh, in the 70s here today and it's looking beautifully. Uh, I'm looking across the street at, at the Ottawa River and uh, green grass and uh, can't wait to start selling this, this destination like it needs to be again. I love it. I love it. Yeah. You know, what, man, Ottawa is such a beautiful place. Like, I, yeah, you know. Playing in the CFL really opened my eyes. I went to, you know, Winnipeg first, and then uh, I ended up getting like traded to go out to Ottawa. And man, like, when I tell you, it was only, it's only, been, it's only a three and a half hour drive from Rochester all yeah. these years. I could have, <laughs> I could have been up there visiting, but I know. Yeah, so beautiful. I know. And when I, when I moved here, Quentin, from Edmonton, uh, which is a prairie city, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not a lot of water around Alberta, even though the Rocky <laughs> Mountains are there and they're magnificent. But where I bought my home here in Ottawa, uh, where I'm talking to you from today, uh, there's sailboats uh, out my window. And I honestly, as a, as a Canadian, <laughs> and I'm ashamed to say I had no idea people sailed in these kinds of numbers here in Ottawa. <laughs> so I absolutely love it. It's beautiful. And thank you for saying that. I know you have an affinity. The CFL really, of the country. Too, so. I, I really do. I love it. Um, what's your fit? Okay, I don't know if you. What, what's your favorite CFL team? Oh my God, you're gonna get me in so much trouble. Oh, no, let, no, no. let me let me put it this way. I <laughs> am a season ticket holder for two CFL teams, and, okay. and and I'm proud of that. And if you were to look in my closet right now you'd see just as much red and black as you would green and gold. So so that might answer your question. Uh, don't ask me who I cheer for when they play each other, but uh, I, uh, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool uh, CFL fan. I'm proud to support uh, my hometown team of uh, Ottawa and my uh, previous hometown team of the Edmonton Eskimos. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> Anybody who hasn't had a chance to watch the CFL, definitely watch it, man. It's great football. When I went up there, it's it great people. Great, the fans are amazing. Make sure you check it out this upcoming season. Hopefully, they are able to go in September. I agree. But, all right, last last question here with the sports. What is your favorite NFL team? Uh oh, well, this one's easier for me. However, I have a feeling that uh, half your podcast audience is going to you know, turn off the dial here in a minute because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of I'm one of those Dallas Cowboys dudes. Oh boy. I, I am, and I know. I'm sorry, but again, I'm gonna I'm gonna blame my childhood. And so, growing up in Western Canada, when we had basically three channels to watch, there was there was usually only one game on every Sunday, and it was generally the Cowboys and Roger Staubach, which will tell you how old I am. And uh, I grew up I grew up on Roger Staubach, and, and quickly got into uh, Tony Dorsett. Doomsday defense and all that kind of stuff. So uh, never did shake the uh, silver and blue of my Cowboys. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't blame you for that. If it was the only thing on TV, maybe you got to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right. So how could someone that is inspired from listening to what you've told tell them today, um, how can they get involved into, into hospitality and tourism? Where does it start? And yeah, how can they get involved? If it's someone from age 18 or maybe someone that wants to switch their job up, <laughs> how do they get involved? Yeah, it's a super, super question. And I know I'm happy to, to answer it in a couple of ways. Um, you know, this, this might be a career that some people can kind of back into by, by accident. Others, uh, you know, very intentionally get into it. So, um, you know, we, we would certainly encourage people to, to go to local educational institutions. Uh, we have an Algonquin College here in in Ottawa that offers an amazing hospitality and tourism program. That's a great way to start because you're then uh, already uh, not only developing the skills, but you're, you're mixing and mingling with, with the right people and getting experience into uh, meeting people that work for tourism bureaus, convention centers, restaurants, other venues, attractions, etc. cetera. Um, apart from that, um, you know, the, the uh, industry needs good people. And, and uh, so all of those businesses I mentioned, whether it's convention centers, attractions, hotels, restaurants, um, that's that's all also a pipeline into this industry. It's certainly the way I got involved. And, uh, and when you do become involved, then I, I would say, you know, be, become uh, more aware of the, of the wider audience. So if, if you work for a restaurant, for example, find out who's working in tourism. Find out what your destination is doing 
in the, in, the, in the ways of global tourism. Who works and runs your local CVB or DMO? I know they're called CVBs in the States, where they're called DMOs, which is the term we use. But, uh, you know, get involved, learn, listen. And, um, you know, the, one of the things that gives me the biggest jolts of energy now in my career is seeing really good, enthusiastic, and passionate young people come through the door. And, you know, your organization is part and parcel of that. You've got a communications and, and marketing and advertising firm that, that has that, that youth element, that passion that you and your family bring to it. Um, that's the kind of skill set and kind of attitude that I look for um, in some ways more than I would in a, in, for a degree. So um, mm-hmm. I, think you, I think you can learn this industry if you have the right attitude. It's not for everybody. You're probably not going to make your first million dollars in hospitality and tourism, but I'll tell you, you'll never be better people. You'll never have mm-hmm. more opportunity to travel places and um, and really wear your heart on your sleeve so it's been a great career um, and I think there's just many different avenues and different ways to get into it wow no that's powerful words right there make sure you know who's ever listening from around the world like that's that's what it takes like you, you sometimes you just gotta take that leap of faith and you're gonna land somewhere but you gotta believe it you gotta believe it absolutely 100 believe and and, uh, and what a great time in our history to keep believing and to keep hope mm-hmm. uh, you know someone told me the other day i think he was from philadelphia and, and, and works for the cdb there and he said you know if, if in times like this if we lose hope and optimism then we're definitely it's game over and, and so this is a you know what a time what a, what a sad time for tourism but at the same time you're asking the question for young people to become inspired uh, by this industry this will be the time that the, the people that have the most the most passion, the most faith, and then the most optimism, the ones that will rise to the top. So, um, right. yeah, I wish anybody uh, nothing but luck that want to get into it. And um, anybody that wants to get in touch with me at Ottawa Tourism, I'm always happy to play the, play the mentor role a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. What's one quote or something that a quote that you live by that you can leave the folks with that can help impact them for the rest of their lives? That's a great one. I'm going to just think about that for a second while you ask me that because, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about some of that inspirational stuff over the last little while. Um, you know, that I was reminded of uh, uh, of one the other day, you know, to, that, that uh, someone was talking about just the state of our, our industry. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a European angle on it, but it means the same thing here. It's talking about you know, right now in tourism. Um, it's not about saving our daily bread. It's about saving the entire bakery. And, uh, you know, I think that that's topical and timely because we are, we're all kind of looking at uh, the challenge ahead of us uh, with that lens right now. So maybe I'll offer that one up to you. It's maybe the one that's uh, coming top of mind. And I'm sure uh, more will come to me after we finish this conversation. But I'll go with that. <laughs> that's good stuff. What's three books? Currently, that either you're reading or your three favorite books that the folks that are listening could uh, uh, start reading. Uh, just started reading Stephen King's uh, uh, 112263, uh, so November 2263. I hope I got that right. It's the uh, it's a bit of a, a take on the uh, JFK assassination. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, it's pretty cool. I'm only just like a hundred pages in. It's a, it's a big book, so I just started that. Um, uh, my son actually wrote a novel that I just, oh. I just read. I just read recently, so I'm going to give him a shameless plug. Um, his name is Zach Duncan, uh, Z-A-C-K, and he wrote a book called Amnesiology, and uh, it's uh, it's his very first attempt at, at writing. Um, but I'm pretty sure you can find it uh, on Amazon or where you look for books. And I'm pretty proud to say I read it all the way through pretty quickly because it held my interest. It was uh, very well written, so. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you those two um, as uh, as my uh, as my most recent uh, reads because the rest of my reading right now has been it's been so industry related and <laughs> webinar related over the last eight weeks that I can't even think of a third book that I've done any time in recent memory. I got you, <laughs> but that's awesome that your son wrote a book. Wow, like how, are you are you? I know you're super proud as a. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Like he's. Uh, He's come through, uh, you know, his training in the uh, uh, kind of the uh, video uh, arts uh, television kind of uh, 
background and, and training, and uh, he's landed a, a career with an organization, global organization that some of you will be, some of your listeners will be familiar with, called Shopify. Um, and so he's kind of a multi-talented guy. I'm lucky to have two boys that uh, have massive amounts of talent, and yeah, they make me proud constantly. And uh, this book uh, is, is worth a read if you get a chance. Definitely, definitely make sure y'all uh, purchase it off of Amazon. Thank so, you. Yeah, yeah, does he have Audible as well? No, he's not. I don't know. I'll ask him that. <laughs> awesome stuff. Hey, Glenn, I appreciate you so much for being on. Um, do you want to, uh, any other plugs uh, with the Ottawa Tourism Board? Anything about the mess that we want to say? Uh, I appreciate that. I just, I, you know, I just really think that I hope that, um, you know, my passion and my optimism maybe comes through here today because this is obviously a devastating time. And when you, you got hold of me and asked me to jump on this uh, conversation for half an hour or so I was thrilled to do it and it's you know it's not so much for me right now about promoting my my city I, you know I think that'll come in time I think it's to wish everybody uh, nothing but the best and health and you know stick with it uh, certainly in tourism stick with it we'll get through this um, look after each other um, hotels and attractions and parks and sports and you know uh, 12, 12 months from now they're all going to be there and we're going to be having a, a different conversation so uh, a lot, of, a lot of short-term pain, but we'll come back. Um, I believe that uh, the world's too uh, too wonderful of a place not to, and uh, I just hope I'm, I'm able to be part of those building blocks to bring it back. So thank you so much, Quentin. I wish you and your family and your your uh, organization nothing but the best. And all of my friends uh, in the U.S. of the border, they mean a lot to us as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And, and uh, everyone in the world, stay healthy, and we'll, we'll get through this together. Thank you, yeah. John, for being on. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Life Journey Podcast with Quentin Gauze. To find out more and to follow the journey, visit Quentin's Instagram at QGauz or our business page at iron underscore visuals. For full recaps of the show, find us on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Thank you for tuning in.